presentation now moving forward i will now request dr john r baker sir to start his presentation dana uh, ma'am i am requesting you to transfer the hosting right to dr john r baker sir please ma'am how do i do that akashak uh, just guide him guide her through just tell her uh, okay Okay, okay. I I will do it. I will do it, ma'am. Just give me few right, minutes. Sir. I will do it. I pre-recorded my presentation to help stay okay. within the time because I covered a lot. Um, I hope you find it as enjoyable to listen to as I I enjoyed giving it. Thank you, John. You have you have always been very patient with us and always a constant uh, strong support. I must say. So Thank sorry you. for the delay that you had. Uh, so well, uh, we'll definitely enjoy your talk as all this. So you can play the video, of course. Uh, sir, I have make you. I have already transferred the hosting right to you, sir. Okay, if you can see me, um, uh, please put your thumb. Dana, can you please put your thumbs up if you can see me? Yes. Okay, great. If you can hear me, put your thumbs up. Participants and organizers, I yes. am pleased to welcome you all to the International Conference on Humanities and Social Sciences. It is indeed an honor to sit before you today to deliver the keynote speech for this prestigious event. I would like to begin by thanking the Suwam Baba Foundation, the University of Bucharest, Istol Limbia Romaine, Department of Modern Languages and Business Communication, and Bantar College. I would also like to extend Perhaps most important, like the humanities and social sciences. The conference helps us to build bridges between people and communities in a world that is often divided by language, culture, and politics. The ability to communicate across these divides is more important than ever. As the great linguist and philosopher Noam Chomsky once said, language is not just words, it's the unification of a community. In this sense, the presentation each of us shares today is not just a personal journey. But again, a collective, a means of building connections, fostering understanding. And so as we participate in this year's conference, let us celebrate our shared passion, and inspire others to join us on this journey of lifelong learning. Let us also celebrate the field's ability to promote global understanding and cooperation. Let us further continue to push the boundaries of our learning and embrace the opportunities these abilities and this event provides. Perusing the presentations we are honored to experience over the next few days, there are many connected themes. And one thing we and our students share is reading. With that in mind, I'd like to share some ideas on how to further promote reading in the form of extensive reading opportunities so that we can sustainably welcome future generations in the fields of humanities and social sciences. We're all pretty familiar with extensive reading, at least we think we are. Um, the funny thing is, though, it's a little deeper, and it's a big area, and it's an exciting area, and it's one I've been working with for about 25 years. So I'd like to work through uh, four basic areas and then another group of areas. Um, I'd like to start with a healthy pause, because that's always a good way to start. Um, I listen to self-access uh, presentations all the time. I've been to about 60 conferences. Um, in my career, I probably presented at about 25 or 30. And I hear one thing. If you believe you can't do it, I guarantee you, you're right. We're done. There's nothing you can do. But if you believe you can, the roads are endless. There's all kinds of possibilities. And if you work with people that are like-minded, you can do anything. Um, 
Now, what is extensive reading? That's a question that needs to be answered before we begin. Extensive reading on the left is reading a lot, reading for pleasure, choosing stuff you like at or below your level, not too far. And reading for your own intentions. Uh, on the right, and by the way, longer passages, you know, several pages, 15, 16 more pages at a go, uh, not a paragraph or a small essay that you find in EFL textbooks. That's a major difference, especially with the number of questions. There, there are no questions in extensive reading. We read because we enjoy it. We're looking for a purpose, not taking the test. Okay, having said that, why extensive reading? Well, extensive reading uh, offers a large amount of comprehensible input, which is frankly is absent in many target language environments. Uh, provides abundant opportunities for vocabulary learning, grammar, spelling, results faster on reading speeds, increased confidence, activity. It also supports the reading writing relationship and every other uh, major and minor skill. Um, some say it's a panacea. Um, is extensive reading new? No. It's been around since about 1740. Uh, Mr. Chow and I, uh, my co-author, uh, did a paper recently where we tracked it back to 1714 L1 settings and 1844 and L2 settings. I'll leave the link there and share it with you later. It's a quite interesting uh, review. Now, uh, Dr. Warren was uh, presenting at BAT Saul recently, and he provided a uh, nice, nice review of the area. In one of his books, he gave a definition of uh, extensive reading. He said it was material was easy, range of topics. Again, students do what they want. They read what they want. They read as much as possible. It's individual assignment, silent. They read for their own reward, no assessment. And the teacher orients, orients and guides the students. Okay. And teachers are role model. This is a pretty good, this is a pretty good definition. Now, uh, I'm sorry, that was Dan Bamberg. Uh, Dr. Warren heard the other day, who's just a super scholar as well, and he expanded this a little bit, expanded on it, a more inclusive definition. And some of the things that he added was the absence or presence of follow-up activities, um, graded or non-graded material. So he opened up the text a little bit. Um, and he also mentioned the easy material requirement. So there's lots of definitions in our field. Now, this is a friend of mine. Um, two friends of mine, actually, and uh, they recently uh, made a definition that I particularly like. Um, it's developing fluency and a positive attitude towards reading. Very, very succinct, very, very nice. They summarized the whole thing. Uh, now, envisioning your extensive reading program, what is it? Well, there's a lot of different kinds. You can do a classroom-based program where you have books in the corner or on boxes or on shelves. The students read in comfortable areas or read on desks. They read by themselves, they read in pairs, or sometimes they read in circles, guided by a teacher, which is kind of fun, as long as there's a combination of it. Other times, you can have a standalone program in a brick and mortar type facility, maybe um, in a library or a special room in school or an after school program or uh, a pull out program where students go during the parts of class times. And they can read comic books and magazines and books and newspapers and graded readers. Graded readers are a big thing. Now, you can also have a designated brick and mortar self access center. Now, these are fun, they're big, and they house a lot of things like writing centers and computer areas, coffee shops, uh, study areas, tutor areas, computer aided language learning. They can be in large uh, metrodomes like this, they can be identical cities, or they can be identical, I'm uh, sorry. Uh, individual centers, or it can be just one room of a building like this one that I had about 25 years ago. Uh, I'm very pleased to say that it's still in operation. I visit it every year, and I'm going to visit it next week. Uh, a friend of mine is managing it now, and it's still going strong. Um, I've had the pleasure of operating and directing four in my career. Uh, now, this is a, a new one that I've worked with recently. Satellite program or satellite node program. This is a non-brick and mortar facility which means it's cheap, okay? Um, in the beginning, we started it with the Language Center as the hub. They were our managers, they were our funders, and we had a self-access reading program, and then we had a self-access listening program, a computer-aided language learning program, a chat program, and a bunch of other things that came into our program. We 
realized that we didn't want to be managed by the language center and we didn't want their funding. It wasn't enough. So we opened up our own program and we double tasked all the facilities around the campus. So we got all the same programs, but we didn't have to pay for them because all the buildings and all the management and all of the cleaning facilities and all the equipment was already there. All we had to do was provide uh, materials and staff. And so our budget needs were cut down from not 100 to 10%. Things work pretty smoothly. Okay, uh, you can be part of a satellite program like I just mentioned, okay? And you can be with all these other wonderful things that go on, or you can take it on the road. A friend of mine in Thailand does this. Uh, she has a truck, she's part of the school, so she goes from school to school, and they bring books to the schools. So it's a wonderful program. Um, I met that person in uh, Vietnam about five years ago at a conference. Uh, you can also have an e-reading program. But you have to be careful here because the books look different on different size, size screens, which can change the reading experience dramatically, especially with regards to speed and, uh, due to the spacing of the screen and the text. Uh, additionally, there's lots of free stuff out there e-books, and there's also commercial stuff. I'm not going to go into the free stuff because I think Dr. Warren did a great job of that. Uh, last week. Uh, now, you can work with local book clubs or outside organizations. Uh, the Fulbright scholars uh, are really great folks to work with if they're in your area. Um, Suji and the like. They'll come in and they'll actually provide tutors as well uh, for pull-out programs. So that's kind of fun. And they'll provide materials. And they have funding. So what's the next step on the journey? When I started this way back in the day, we had brick-and-mortar programs. Gardner and Miller published a lot of these. Now we're looking at satellite nodes. What's next? You guys are on the ground right now. And if you believe you can do it, you can guide this field in so many wonderful ways. There'll be things that we haven't even thought of in the next few years, and you're going to be the ones to think of them. And that's the exciting part. The other thing is you need to design your program. And I'm going to say this. You can work with people. You can do anything. Dale Carnegie. Okay, that's the truth. If you can't work with people, you're dead in the water. But if you can work with people, you can create. You also want to have a strong organizational culture okay, because your team really, really stands on a director staff relationship. So you have to have a very charismatic, organized, efficient, and good, good director. Um, and you want to choose a transformational leadership style that values everyone. Okay? And that sort of thing will give really great outcomes. Also, you want to bring your uh, a small group structure in. You want to work really small in the beginning because you want to have everybody on board. I think Bezos 5 to 7 is a pretty good uh, thing with the old the, the two pizza rule. Um, now, you want to have your teachers on board, because if your teachers are motivated, students are going to be motivated. We just finished a study that shows the teacher's motivation strongly impacts students' involvement, students' achievement, self-access programs, self-access reading programs, or extensive reading programs. Okay. Now, you also want to embrace the special and differences of your teachers. And there's going, to, there's going to be conflict. There's going to be conflict, and that's really great. Okay, it's Tuckman's model, four step model, forming, storming, norming, and performing, and the journey later, which you hope not to do. But all that diversity is going to bring some wonderful things into the program. So you need to embrace everyone rather than directing everyone. Uh, now, if you're considering notes, which I just described a minute ago, um, you're going to want to work with department heads because they're going to be giving you your, your facilities and supplying you with uh, places to do all the cool things and a lot of the equipment that you want to have. Uh, now, the boon for you is additional space at no additional cost. That's nice. Uh, the department stakeholders love it because their usage counts goes up, which means they get more funding in their departments. So it sounds like they're doing you a favor, but really you're doing them a favor. In fact, you're both doing each other a favor. Now, students like uh, these nodes because they can do it at different locations, and that's kind of nice at different times. Okay, 
proposing your extension program, extensive reading program, you need to consider your location, your scheduling. Uh, you want to make sure that students are not in classes during the time you're offering a program because if they're in classes, you're wasting your resources. They can't come. Uh, you want to think about the materials. Are they at the students' levels? You want to think about your startup costs. That's going to be your, your biggest part of it. Your maintenance costs, not so much if you plan it right. Uh, your staffing, uh, you're going to use teachers. You're going to use TAs. You're going to use students. You're going to use volunteers. You may use a staff member. Um, promotion activities, which we'll talk about in a second. We're going to talk about assessment and benefits to the students. Okay. Um, now, creating and implementing your program. Now, this program was uh, created by a good friend of mine and uh, an advisee, uh, Chow, from the Highway Top Elementary School right here in Ho Chi Minh. Uh, now, Chow is a wonderful teacher. And the first thing he did is he gave the students a pretest. Now, you could use the scholastic reading inventory, which is a standardized test, but he didn't have that. So he used a more basic uh, five finger test to use this, check the students' levels. Cheap, easy, fast, very efficient. And then he chose books based on that using their eye level one step below. And he got the mean of the students with standard deviation to choose a good uh, range of books. He also considered things like students' background knowledge, uh, topics, and the like. Uh, now, onboarding. He had to introduce the students to the program very early on. Okay? And he had to teach students also how to choose books at their five-finger 95% level. Once he did this, he got to start running the program. 30 minutes was allotted to each class. Now, you can do this as a pull-out program. You can do this as a weekend program. You can do it as a uh, take-home program. Uh, this is how he did it. During the program, the students got to read the silent reading, and he modeled it. Okay. The students were encouraged to do one book a week. Uh, they kept a reading log, which you're going to need for your assessment later. Uh, also, the students self-selected books, and there was a poster to motivate students' usage. Now, if you want to keep it small like he did, uh, you have more books than students, okay? about 10% 10, 10 more per, than students. And now funding is easy because every student buys one book. You get 10 more, and now you have the books. Now, at the end of the year, the students donate the books, and this grows exponentially. Okay? You can also visit publishers at, at conferences. They'll give you books. You can ask for sample copies. You can look in your library. They have some. You can donate, you can get donations, and you can get a small budget to start. They're not that expensive, surprisingly. Now, you can start this program with soft money. This is where the schools have funds and grants or things like that. Soft money lasts a year, research funding. So you need hard funding to keep you going. And if you once you really, really get going down the road, you can be part of the school's recognized program. So you're not under a language center or someplace else, you're handout. So there's lots of ways you can do it under a language center, under an English program, in your own slot, or you can be a classroom facility. Um, it all depends on the amount of budget, how hard you want to go. Okay. Now, staffing, um, depending on the size of your program, you may or may not need a director. You may or may not need teaching monitors, depending on how big it is. You may or may not need support staff. You may or may not need parents and volunteers, but you probably are going to need student volunteers, and they're free. And that's nice. Uh, you may or may not need a salary. Um, if you do need students or if you do need staff, it could be part of their duties. There are several ways to pay them here, including volunteering, double tasking, um, or in lieu of administrative duties. Okay, <clears throat> you're going to want to assess your extensive reading program. Why? Because numbers matter. Numbers are what, what get the bean counters to provide money. Excellence is what we call it. You provide numbers, you're showing excellent, you're meeting the bottom line. They'll give you money. Now, uh, usage counts produce funds. The number of books read produce funds. Whether the resources resources are be being used efficiently produces funds. This is with usage counts and logs and other things you keep, and you can do it virtually or on paper. I've given you some examples. I'll leave this uh, PowerPoint available to the participants. Uh, now, you can also uh, assess qualitatively with surveys. And because they're kids, you can use uh, smiley face icons uh, instead of the one to five scale or the one to four scale or the one to seven scale or the one to 10 Likert scale. Uh, you can do surveys and you can do interviews. You can also do teacher logs, okay? Uh, all the whole qualitative range of uh, assessments available to you. 
Now, you can also talk about academic achievement by using standardized tests. Warning, reading, though it produces lots and lots of achievement, doesn't necessarily show that achievement quickly in standardized tests. They, they, standardized tests grade large amounts of achievement. This is baby step, baby step, baby step in a longitudinal steady way. However, test scores can show it. Course grades can show it. Overall grades in all subjects can show it. Show it. And this is the number one, student retention. Now I'm gonna break for a personal story here. Many years ago, I had a kid in one of my classes. Handsome young kid, real nice kid. Wasn't doing really well in school. Why? Couldn't read. In college, he couldn't read. Now, in Chinese, his English reading wasn't that good. His reading wasn't too great. And in English, it wasn't too good. But he had a girlfriend. His girlfriend was an academic superstar. And he wanted to spend time with her. She wanted to spend time in the extensive reading program. You can guess the rest. She became his tutor. He started getting good grades. He stayed in university. He didn't drop out. School got tuition. That's retention rate. You start showing retention rates, you get more funding. Now, at the end of four years, the kid stayed in school. He loved the program. And he was almost in tears when he graduated. He came up and gave me a great big hug and thanked me for helping him get through school. Uh, now, sustaining your program, you're going to have to have it convenient, conveniently accessed. Um, either in the classroom or in a brick and mortar or online. You're gonna have to do it at convenient times and you're gonna have to have material that's easily located. You're gonna have to have stakeholder support, faculty participation, students' belief in the program. You're gonna have to have public relations. You're gonna have to be very visible. That means posters, brochures, handouts, flyers, campus newsletters. You're gonna to wanna to hit all your stakeholders. If you're on the radio, you can get just a plug from any resource outside. You want to get parents involved. School, you can do school recruitment. Um, anything you can do, websites to become more visual will help you get funding. Okay, uh, now quarterly end of, your, end of your reports. You're going to want to give reports on number of students, number of books read, students' motivation, liking, and academic achievement. And you can use all those assessment features that we talked about a few seconds ago to do that. You give this report to all of the stakeholders because those stakeholders have a meeting every year you're not involved in. But if everybody's on board, your budget comes up, you'll get more people voting to support you. Okay, ladies and gentlemen, I hope I stayed within my time limit. My name is John Baker. It is indeed an honor to be part of this community. Um, there's my uh, email and there's my ORCID. I genuinely hope we'll stay in contact and we can build something wonderful together. Thank you very much. All right, ladies and gentlemen, um, thank you for the opportunity to share this with you. I hope this presentation plants a seed in your minds to inspire future programs for the institutions that you work for. And like my friend in Thailand who took it on the road and went to poor rural areas and helped help the world grow in some really wonderful ways. All right, thank you again for allowing me to be part of this community. I'm looking forward to the rest of the conference. Bye for now. Thank you so much, John. It was wonderful. And definitely we look forward for certain projects in these areas. So all of us can collaborate and Dana is a very active researcher. And uh, so uh, I think uh, Dana, Eliana and all of us together can really think of something good and productive. Thank you so much, John.